Well, amen. It's good to worship with our faith family today. We are thankful that you're here. And uh, it was cold, dreary, wintry day here in Mobile, Alabama today. But we're so thankful that you're here. We pray that you have sensed the presence and power of God as we've sung and worshiped and prayed. I know that we have on our row and in our hearts, and I treasure and trust that you have as well today. This morning we do have a, a topic that will be, I pray, used by God in a powerful way to help us as a church in many different levels. And um, so if you have a Bible, and I hope you do, if you'll turn to Matthew 19, first of all today, Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19. And we're going to read the first 12 verses of Matthew chapter 19. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to test him and tested him by asking, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife? For any cause. And he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. And they said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you that whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, as such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so, been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of God, of, of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Now, I want to go ahead and read 13 and 14 while you're there in your Bible. Because... Children are involved in the family dynamic. Then Jesus brought to him that he might lay his hands, excuse me, then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. I don't think it's any accident at all that Matthew, when he recounts this story, adds in about the children. And we see that the primary topic here, uh, they're questioning Jesus about divorce. And is it lawful for a man to put his wife away? Deuteronomy 24 would be the Old Testament scripture there that they're questioning him about. And I, I, I love how Jesus cuts to the chase and goes to scripture the old testament scripture of his day but before i try to unpack this topic today i would like for us to pray one more time so if you'd bow with me this morning and we will pray allow me to pray for us our father in heaven father we do come today with heavy hearts and brokenness. Father, there are physical battles that are underway and spiritual and the mental and emotional battles that are underway. Father, we, we just look to you right now through Jesus by the Holy Spirit and we, we plead for mercy. 
We are desperate, Father, for you to work in hearts and lives and families. Father, in fact, we as a local church, we are a family of believers. And we are not immune to sin and temptation and heartache and failure. And Father, I know that there are many in this room today who sense many of these responses or perhaps even almost all of them. There are those who have come to the end of their rope. They've done all they know to do. And yet, Lord, it's not been enough. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to grant us the grace that we need, the knowledge, the wisdom, the patience, the love, Whatever it might be, Lord, that we need, you know better than we ourselves know of that need. And your hand is mighty to save. Your hand is mighty to work and to deliver and to take us out of the kingdom of darkness and place us into the kingdom of your Son of glorious light. And so I pray that you would do a special work in our hearts today. I pray, Father, for strength and grace to preach your word. It is our authority, Lord. And may here at Crawford Baptist Church we always speak the truth in love. As Pastor Jared, Father, said right during the prayer time, the gospel is good news even when it's difficult news. And so, Lord, again, arrest our attention. Help us in our minds focus. May we set our minds' attention and our hearts' affection upon you. We praise you for who you are, Father, and for what you have done for us and in through the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We commit this time now of study of your word to you, and I pray that you would enlighten and illumine our minds and transform lives. And, Lord, I pray you would grant hope today individuals to men women young people families be glorified in our worship we pray in jesus name amen and amen well amen this morning we will continue our series as brother kenneth has said we speak jesus pastor jared also referenced that it's a series that uh, brother kenneth started for us the first sunday of january uh we speak Jesus. And today our, our topic is going to be based from Matthew 19. We're going to go back and look at Genesis chapter 2. We speak, G, we speak Jesus. And today we're going to look at Jesus on uh, human sexuality. Jesus on, as I entitled it, biblical sexuality. There's some, there are a number of reasons why this is important for us today. Um, one is, is that we're all sexual creatures. Um, that's just how God created us. There's no mention of humanity in the Bible apart from gender and apart from uh, sexuality in that regard. The gender is mentioned in the, in the very beginning in Genesis 1. We'll see that in the Scriptures momentarily this morning. Another reason is because of world developments. Uh, in our neighbor to the north, Canada, Bill C-4 became law on January 8th of 2022, which... Uh, basically criminalizes evangelism and the proclamation of biblical truth concerning manhood and womanhood in that nation on Wednesday night. We were blessed to be able to watch a, a podcast which kind of unpacked that, and we got to hear from two different Canadian pastors uh, who spoke uh, on that podcast concerning this particular bill that has just gone into effect in Canada which puts them at risk of being imprisoned for simply preaching biblical truth on this topic. And so we were greatly informed, and we had a good Q&A after our session on Wednesday night. And as promised last week, I want to come and try to bring Jesus' teaching on biblical sexuality today. 
And I chose the text Matthew 19 because these are the words of Jesus. In fact, if you happen to have a red letter edition of the Bible, then you will see that much of Matthew 19 in your edition is in red print. I prefer the black letter edition because all of Scripture is inspired by God and breathed out uh, for our instruction and for our conviction and our edification and growth in Christ. But hey, if you have a red letter edition, and I own some red letter editions, I do. My ultra thin, I think, is a red letter edition. Um, is, your, is your ultra thin, Mary Grace, red letter? It is. See, the ultra thin, a lot of the ultra thins are red letter editions. And so... Um, it's okay. But do you know this? Do you know when the first red letter New Testament came out? I didn't know that I researched it this week. 1899. That's kind of late in church history. The first full red letter Bible was published in 1901. And so again, we see that the red letter editions that many of us are so used to are very new and recent when it comes to church history and biblical studies. But that's beside, I just wanted to lay that information on you this morning. But in Matthew chapter 19, we do see Jesus addressing this, this key issue. But what is happening here in, in Canada and, is, it, and, and hate speech laws around the world are seeking to be rewritten where it is illegal to speak about certain sinful behaviors described in the Bible. And it's very important to say this at the outset, that uh, sin is sin. And there are some sins, though, that the Bible describes from God's own mouth as abominations. That, that just make him sick to his stomach, as it were. And so, but here's something at Crawford Baptist Church, I want to lay this out on the front end, is that we all struggle with sin. In fact, pretty much every human in ways struggles with sexual sins once you get to a certain stage of your physical and mental development. It is a part of our life in a Genesis 3 world. So uh, this morning, my aim is to present what Jesus teaches on biblical sexuality, and we will go from that point. My, my big idea today, my big idea today is that God designed, and this will be on the screen, I think, God designed human sexuality and marriage for His glory and for human flourishing. That is our big idea. God has designed human sexuality and marriage for His glory and human flourishing. And what we need to understand is, is that God's divine design is always best. That, that there, is, there is no wisdom that is going to ever be greater or more correct than God's wisdom. And so today, we, we are under the authority of Scripture as we look at this passage and then flip back to the early chapters in Genesis for a few moments this morning. But I want you, I want you to get that big idea written down in place because it is God who designed human sexuality and marriage for His glory and for human flourish. You know, if you look in Matthew 19, we're not going to exposit this paragraph or this text. We're going to use this as a launch pad and go back. But I want you to see this. When, when the Pharisees asked Jesus the question about this, they ask about divorce. And so he goes back and says, have you not read? And that's a challenging question for us. Have we read? Have we studied the Scripture the way that we are commanded to. And, and I know I need to study it more than I do. And I get paid to study it, to preach. I get paid to study it, to teach at the University of Mobile. And so, but, but beyond that, I have a responsibility as a Christian just to, to immerse myself in the truth of Scripture. But, but it's a great question from the, from the lips of Jesus. Have you not read 
And notice this, that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now we here know, or we should know that Jesus is not making up something new here. He's quoting from the words of Moses from Genesis chapters 1 and 2 in those statements. And of course, then they say, well, why did Moses command us to divorce our wives? And he says, well, basically, Moses didn't command you to. He allows you to in, Gen in Deuteronomy 24 because of the hardness of your heart. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, that would be back in Genesis, it was not so. And so this morning... As we think about this, I want you to flip back now to the first book of the Bible. We're going to go and see what Jesus was referencing there when he was being questioned and tested by the Pharisees. And so if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 26 for a moment, down through 28, just to help set the stage here. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. And then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Notice this now, male and female, he created them. Verse 28, the cultural mandate, and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And so in these basic verses, we see this, that uh, before God ever created marriage, he created man as male and female. Look in Genesis 1, 27 for a second. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Now, wh what I want you to see, again, the big idea is, is, is before us. It's God designed human sexuality and marriage for his own glory and for human flourishing. And if you take notes, my first kind of big point is very basic, but it is this. It is that God created marriage, not man. God created marriage, not man. Now, that seems so elementary, my dear Watson, and so foundational and fundamental, and it is all of those things and much more. It, it is the Word of the living God. And so we see here that, that God created marriage, not, not man. Uh, and, and before God ever created marriage, He created man, and He made them male and female. So what that says is gender is an essential part of what it means to be human. Gender is an essential part of what it means to be human. From the very first mention of humanity in the Bible, there is no reference to humanity apart from the reference to gender. And it's very crucial for us in our day today to understand gender is not a social construct. Gender was not designed by man or by woman, for that matter. Uh, gender is a divine design. Gender is essential to what it means to be made in the image of God. And here's something I had found in my study interesting. The maleness of males, the maleness of males and the femaleness of females both display the image of God. And listen to this. Men image God in ways that the females do not, and the females image God in the way that men do not. But here's the bottom line. Gender is essential for the fulfillment of the cultural mandate. Now, we, we read that in Genesis 1, 28. If you want to look at it in your Bible, I encourage you to do so. God bless them. That's a good thing. When God blesses you, that is an awesome thing. Amen? And then God said, okay, I'm blessing you. I'm pouring out grace on you here, all right? But here it is. I got a mission for you. 
God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over these critters. That's what he's saying in Genesis 1. We call that the, the cultural mandate. This is what God is commanding Adam and Eve to do there in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. So gender difference is born out of the intentional inadequacy of each gender. Now, I'm going to say that again. Gender difference is born out of the intentional inadequacy of each gender. And what that means in simple King James English is, hey, we need each other. God made the man to need the woman. Look there in Genesis 2.18. Look in Genesis 2, 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. And all the men in the room should say, amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That is a good, good thing. It is not good for the man to be alone. In fact, this is our memory verse that I chose for this week. Verse 18. Then the Lord God said, right? And, and so we'll talk about it. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. I will make him a helper fit for him. Genesis 2, 18. And so gender then difference is born out of the intentional inadequacy of each gender. We need one another. Now right off the right out of the gate. Right out of the gate, there are going to be people who say, okay, you see there, the Bible is patriarchal. The Bible is all about men. The Bible is about lifting men up and putting women down. Listen to me. That is not right. There has been no religion on planet earth that, as taught from its holy book, has elevated the woman to the position that she's to occupy. You can be an Islamic woman and you walk behind your husband as chattel property and you speak when spoken to. And listen, I'll say it this way rightly interpreted and taught Christianity elevates the woman like no other worldview or religion on the planet. Now, I know there have been abuses. In fact, we all have abused the teachings of Scripture to some degree because we're in a Genesis 3 world and we're Genesis 3 people. We are totally depraved to the core. We are rotten. We are wicked. We are rebellious. And apart from God's grace, as we have sung in some of our songs this morning, then there we are. But thank God for restraining grace. We aren't as evil as we could be as far as in what we act out. It's in here. The murder's in here. The rape is in here. The harsh words are in here. The abuse is in here. The sassy talking is in here. But as God's grace comes in and restrains us from doing, we're, we're not acting out as bad and as evil as we actually are in our hearts. And thank God for his restraining grace. This play, there would be no one hardly alive on planet earth if God's restraining grace was not at work today. Even in Muslim nations like Somalia, the people group we prayed for this morning, the people group of the day, and, and in your own home Listen, we would be at each other's throats. We would be punching, kicking, stabbing, shooting, cursing. We would do all of those things. But God's grace is restraining us from acting out on the evil that is already in our hearts. And so, but here's the word in Genesis 2. 2.18. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the man should be alone. We all say amen to that. The men do. I will make him a helper. You see, you're kind of putting us down. And listen, this is why I want to rightly interpret the Word of God. This word helper is in no way a derogatory word towards the woman at all. I put this in the notes. 16 of 19 times... 16 of 19 times in the Old Testament, the word helper refers to God himself. God didn't put God down, and God's not putting the woman down, even though she's described as a helper. There's no inferiority implied here. In fact, in Psalm 10, I looked this up uh, to give you a reference, Psalm 10, verse 14 
I think I corrected it on the Facebook notes. I hope we did. Uh, on Psalm 10, verse 14, uh, the helper of the fire. God is described as the helper of the fatherless. And again, there are 16 times that word is used in the Old Testament where it refers to God. That didn't exclude, uh, it didn't include the New Testament. I mean, Jesus says, hey, when I ascend back to the Father, we are going to send a helper to come alongside of you. It's the word parakletos, but we're going to, so again, in the English, helper, comforter is another translation there. But again, helper is not a, a, a word that implies any inferiority at all. In fact, really the opposite is the truth. Genesis 2, 18, look at it. Then the Lord God said, this is God speaking to us now. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. You see, Adam alone could never accomplish or fulfill the cultural mandate, which says, again, be fruitful and multiply. That ain't happening with just Adam. It ain't happening. It can't happen. It just would not work. That's not how God designed his divine design. So Adam could never accomplish the mission on his own. He needed the woman. And so the Lord says, I will make him a helper, okay, not inferior, but a helper to complement him. Notice it, fit, that word fit for him. Fit is implying a like opposite. In other words, Eve looks like Adam. You know, he's going to have to name all the animals and stuff, and you got the giraffes and the zebras and the rhinoceroses and all these things, and the monkeys swinging from tree to tree, and you got the little squirrels darting about and all these things, and, you know, and he notices, you know, there's kind of male and female in every one of them. He's sitting around the campfire eating his pork and beans and turnip greens and all that stuff and cornbread, and he's by himself. And everybody else in creation has kind of got somebody. And he's all alone. We're going to see that in, in the next com upcoming verses, Genesis 2, 19 through 23, right? But, but again, so Eve is, is to be fit for Adam. That implies a like opposite. In other words, God made us different that he might make us one. God made us different that he might make us one. This brings up the biblical doctrine or truth of complementarianism complementarianism has suffered some hard days in the press recently. But complementarianism simply is the biblical teaching that God created the man and woman, and they are equals. And that's amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Man and woman are equal in the eyes of God, but complementarianism teaches that God created the man and the woman with different roles and responsibilities in the marriage relationship. And that is crucial for the successful thriving of marriages and homes. And as we all know, when we hurt at home and in our families, I mean, we hurt all over. We are deeply wounded and bruised and crushed and battered. When, when, when things are not good at home, we in a mess. And Satan's initial temptation came in a husband-wife relationship. And I'm going to tell you, he has not slowed down at all to this very day. He is attacking marriages. He's attacking families and children and boys and girls and teenagers and young people. And all of this is in play. And in our own local church faith family, we, we, we are broken. And we are on our knees weeping. And we are weeping for our situation. And we're weeping for your situation. And we don't even know all of your situations. But we know that Satan has not taken his foot off the gas yet. He is busy. He has come to seek, kill, and destroy. He comes and murders. He lies. He murders. He destroys. He's come to seek, kill, and destroy. That's what he does. And we have to be reminded in this century, hey, he's still doing that. His M.O. has not changed at all from the beginning. He's still the liar and the father of all lies. He is a murderer, Jesus says in John chapter 8. And so he is busy at work, and he loves to, 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 to knock down complementarianism. Why? It's the biblical teaching on the divine design 
for marriage and really for gender. God has made us male. Be a manly man. Be a womanly woman. This is important. There's a definition of marriage that I came across from Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. And Dr. Kostenberger defined marriage this way. Marriage is a sacred bond between a man and a woman instituted by and publicly entered into before God normally consummated by sexual, and I put in the word, intimacy. This is in a book which I highly would recommend that we purchase. There's a second edition out now. God, Marriage, and Family is the name of this book. Some of my classes will be reading it. Um, my apologetics class will be reading that this semester. God, Marriage, and Family by Dr. Andreas Kostenberger. It's a biblical theology of God marriage, family, and it addresses the, the different issues that we face today in this Genesis 3 world. It's a very highly recommended book. But again, we have to, marriage then is designed to be between a man, a biological man, and a biological woman. And, and, and let's, be, let's just keep it biblical here. This whole epidemic of divorce is a horrific sin today. And how lightly we take our covenant before God and before men when we enter into ma marriage. is not just, you know, we're going to work it and try it out a little bit. And, you know, he gets mad. and she Who doesn't get mad? May they be the first to step up and come finish this sermon because I'm not worthy of that. But again, we, we, so there's no one sin we aim at with Scripture today. It, it's a plethora of sins that we need to examine our own hearts for and, and thank God for what we've sung about this morning. We, we repent and we find grace. And not one man, a woman, a young person in, this, in, in the hearing of me today can walk out of this place and say, well, you know, man, my family, we got it all together. I'm being the biblical man, bless her heart. She's blessed to have me. You're the most blind of all. If you ain't struggling this morning, listen, if this word didn't cut into your heart with surgery, surgery precision, something's wrong. It's not my brother nor my sister, oh Lord, standing in need of prayer, but it's me. It's me. Don't come in here and pretend like you got it all together. Don't you dare come into this place, a house of worship, with brothers and sisters that you are closer to because you're in Christ than your own physical family. Do not come in here and be a hypocrite and lie to us and to God. The one who says he has no sin makes God himself a liar because God says we all sin we cannot play around with any of these issues and so number one I got to move along number one God created marriage not man number two number two God gives and governs our desire for marriage God gives and governs our desire for marriage Marriage is the primary mechanism for the dance of the genders. The gender is supposed to get along, like when you are dancing. I know we're Baptists, and so uh, anyway, uh, but C.S. Lewis uses this type of language in uh, mere Christianity. So, um, but marriage is the primary mechanism for the dance of the genders. The dance of marriage is based on the dance of the Trinity. And that's coming from C.S. Lewis there. But, but again, so in other words, they, 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 they interact lovingly, and they're faithful to one another. And so, so there's that, that unity of purpose and, and, and drive there. And so, but God gives and governs our desire for it. Look in your Bible, if you would, Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. I want to say one more thing as you're looking at 19, okay? I, I started in Matthew 19 because... 
that's Jesus directly speaking to issues. He, rela he refers us back to Genesis 2, the words of Moses. The words of Moses here were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And so what I want to say, too, is when, when the Bible speaks, God speaks, whether that's in Genesis or Matthew, whether that's in Leviticus or Revelation. When the Bible speaks, God speaks. Are you with me? So, uh, again, if you have a red letter edition, hey, you're still my friend. I love you. It's okay. I own some as well. That's fine. But we do need to understand that the, the, the very first word in the beginning, God created the heavens, that's God speaking to us too today. And the point is, is when our Lord and Savior speaks on an issue, we ought to take that to heart and strive to obey what he is commanding us to do and to be, to be and to do. But also, when the Bible as a whole speaks, that's the Father speaking, that's the Son speaking, and that's the Holy Spirit speaking. We can't, we can't chop up the Trinity into different persons, and some would call them parts, which is completely heretical in all of these things. We, no, they are all three unified. The Father and the Son never had a disagreement, nor the Holy Spirit. They are all in unity as to purpose right? And so we have to kind of keep that in mind because of the way we've been taught in recent decades in our own country, right? So look at Genesis 2, 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So Adam is, has the responsibility from God to name creation the creatures that are made so he get, god gave him a job god gave him the knowledge to do that and that's what he did so the man gave names to all livestock and the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field and so again he's noticing okay there 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 are the horses and there's the you know the, the birds of different sorts and there's the all these things and there's a male and a female notice there in verse 20 but for adam there was not found a helper, there's our word, helper fit for him. And so the Lord moves into action. He's promised in verse 18 he's going to do this. It's not good for the man to be alone, but I will make him a helper fit for him. The Lord right here, again, faithful to his word, he does what he had said he would do. So verse 21, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, as he's waking up, wiping that sleep out of his eyes, kind of like you're at, at, uh, at the, uh, the surgery center. And you're, you're coming up and you're waking up and you look up there and there's Jared looking at you. <laughs> but, but instead of seeing Jared, you see a beautiful wife. I mean, this was what I call the first surgery where God used anesthesia to put the man to sleep. Some women argue quite forcefully that men have never fully recovered from that first and you know, dose of that. <laughs> Probably rightly so. I mean, one's from Mars and one's from Venus or something like that, right? So, but anyway, the Lord put the man into a deep sleep and he operated on him and then from the side of Adam, literally, it's from the side of Adam, he, he beautifully, artistically, amen, designed woman to be a helper fit for the man. That's what the Lord is doing here in, in Genesis, chapter, describing what he had done. And then the man, in verse 23, he breaks out into what some call a song, <laughs> um, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. There's excitement in these words, no matter whether it's a song or not, all right? Um, this is last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Oh. Um, the word woman there, Adam named her. He named her woman because she was taken out of man. Ish and Isha man and out of man the word woman literally means out of man and since that time every other man's come out of woman amen but again you see god's perfect beautiful divine design here and so 
what I'm going to say is God gives and governs our desire for marriage. So God gives us the desire to get married, and we see that. Now, again, there is Matthew 19 talks about not everyone can accept this. You go over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and there are verses in that chapter that seem to teach that there is a gift of singleness that some individuals will have, but the majority of human beings in every culture and historical period of time, most have come together in a covenant of marriage. Maybe not fully understanding as we can do because we have the Bible and we, we're being taught the Bible and, and the Bible fills with, with information and knowledge and insight on what marriage actually is, what it's designed by God to be and how through the power of the Holy Spirit we live for the glory of Christ in our marriages. A lot of people don't have that, but they're still... Married is, is one of those things that God established at creation. And so they're all men of all religions, all men, women of all religions that you see this institution of, of marriage. And so God gives us that. So if you, if you are uh, a young person and, you know, it, it kind of, it, it's interesting because like in middle school, usually a transition happens, right? The guys are saying, ooh, girls, I don't want a girl locker next to mine, you know, kind of thing. And then they have an epiphany somewhere by at least eighth grade, and they're thinking, man, i got to have one of these, you know? I mean, something, but, but, but th it is not unnatural for a, and the girls are usually more advanced than the guys in this thing. So, so ladies, you just got to understand, have patience and restraint always, but remember that the, the boys are still throwing dirt clods and playing G.I. Joe, and you're like dreaming about marrying one of these Seventh grade boys, right? Uh, but that's another sermon for another day. Uh, but anyway, but the, their development usually is not on equal pace with one another on that. But, but again, for most of humanity, there's going to be that attraction and desire between man and woman, between woman and man. And this is natural. And we are parents to encourage it. It's the biblical way. But of course, there must be boundaries. And again, God not only gives us the desire to get married. Listen, God governs our desire for marriage. God governs our desire for marriage. Number one, God made a woman for Adam. And so that's not up for debate. God made a woman for Adam. It's very clear in Scripture. Eve is his like opposite. She is human. She bears the image of God uh, as Adam himself bears the image of God. Yet Eve is opposite him and unique in her own way. And Eve's uniqueness is divinely uh, in instituted and designed, if you will, her, her uniqueness is divinely uh, designed so she can come alongside Adam and complement him, not compete with him, not replace him, but to complement him. This, again, is that biblical teaching of complementarianism in scripture. So, so when I say God governs our desire for marriage, marriage is, as we saw in Dr. Kostenberger's definition, it is for a biological man and a biological woman to come together in a covenant before God and before the assembled witnesses, and you create your own little gospel outpost as husband and wife. And by the way, you don't have to wait for the children to come before you become a family. Listen, when you become husband and you become wife, you family. You know, some people say, well, we're going to wait. We'll, we'll do the family thing. No, no, you're already a family. The Bible says get after it. Be fruitful and multiply. That's the word. And in the West, we've, we, 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 have not, uh, we have diminished that Scripture a lot. But God governs our desire for marriage. Number one, God made a woman for Adam. God made a woman for Adam. And so we see the, 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 the marital pattern is for a man and a woman to come together in holy matrimony. Also, biblically speaking, and point number two before I go to number three and we're done, but this is very important. Christian marry a Christian. Now, everybody gets married. You already said, Pastor Jay, aren't Christians. I know that. I mean, Buddhists get married. Shintoists get married. Muslims get married. Jews without Christ get married, secularists so-called 
There's really nothing in the secular realm. It's all God's world. Amen. There really is no true secular. I mean, you know, we, we rise up just like in Genesis 10, right? With the tower of the Bible, God says, be scattered and, and multiply and fill the earth and, you know, take the fame of my name across this globe and all of this. And what do they do? They build that tower in the city and then God comes in judgment, right? We're supposed to take the, the fame of the name of Jesus to the ends of the earth. We're supposed to be fruitful and multiply. And we do that physically at our marriage covenant but we do it spiritually by seeking to disciple others and to proclaim the gospel of christ to others and that's our mission as the church but you will see this theme in 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 scripture that that the believer the christian i'll call them should marry a christian so first thing when i teach this at um is well well, what what verse you got on that (coughs) well one would be second corinthians 6 14 you can jot that down. Second Corinthians six fourteen. Do not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. You say, well, you know, that can be applied in different things. Well, it can, but I think marriage is one of them for sure. That's that was Second Corinthians six fourteen. Do not be unequally yoked together. But you can also write down First Corinthians seven thirty nine. First Corinthians seven thirty nine says, you know, if, if your spouse has died, and you are now lonely and you want to you know you have those desires to to be married again those are not bad first corinthians 7 30 7 39 says though you can remarry but it says this in first corinthians 7 39 only in the lord now you can look up the commentaries you can go to our church library you can go online and you can all those things and you can study uh what does that mean only in the Lord? But let me just save you a little time and tell you, only in the Lord means you marry a Christian. Christian, you should marry a Christian. And again, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 39. And you say, well, you know, I'm still not convinced. Well, you know, if, if, if the Bible won't convince you, listen to me, I'm not going to convince you. You're going to go do what you want to do. And there will be repercussions for when you violate the teachings and commands of Scripture. But these verses to me are very significant. And in, th- in fact, you think about it, you know, like, like if, if I'm a strong going, you know, Baptist gal, for e- instance. And I love the Lord, and I'm memorizing the Scripture memory verse of the week, and I go to community group, and I sing in the choir, and I, I'm, I'm in discipleship group on campus or at work. We meet for prayer once a week or whatever it might be. We meet the flagpole at school and, you know, FCA and all this stuff. And, and then you come into a relationship that is not godly. That's going to tend to pull you away and I, I've had this happen. I remember when I was serving the military ministry out in Memphis, Tennessee, when I was in seminary the first time. And I remember I taught a unit on dating and marriage to them. And I, I remember talking to this guy. His name was Rob. And he said, yeah, but she, she's such an awesome sailor. And I can, I, I, can, I can get her to come to Bellevue. And I can get her to, to do this and to do that. And, and, and it wasn't too many weeks before Rob wasn't getting on the bus to come to church like he was. And so I came up with a little thing. It's not a chapter and verse in the Bible. It's really not. But it's just something I taught these servicemen back in the late 1980s. Dating is not the place for evangelism. Dating is not the place for evangelism. And you see, it's going to start there in our culture. Now, there were arranged marriages back in the day. So, so Papa talked to a, a girl's Papa and set y'all up and when when you got to be 14 as a girl pretty much okay it's time for us to go feel the deal here and, and seal the deal and get you married and that's kind of how it worked but see in our whole culture we, we don't have too much of that going on today that i'm aware of right so whom you date is going to impact whom you marry and so therefore like within our youth ministry and I've, I've told our youth guys uh this year i i really want us to have a good in-depth Wednesday night study with our youth on um, the birds, the bees, and the Bible, so to speak. That's just my quick temporary type. But on biblical sexuality, 
and on the role of the man and the woman in 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 relationships because you know uh, the bible isn't just address dating because dating wasn't a thing now courtship is a thing and that's where you have you set your intentions upon the young lady sir and by the way men you gotta you gotta wake up tighten up your belt and and be a man you're supposed to be the initiator the man by god's divine design is the initiator do all men do this they absolutely do not there are men who abuse girls they toss them aside they break their spirits they lie to them and all of that sin doesn't take away from God's divine design it's just what we have in a Genesis 3 hurtful world and this is even more why it's important for families to be able to come together and to hug and to cry together and to pray together and to plant themselves upon scripture together and then to have a a, a local church listen that will love you enough to tell you the truth but listen to me will not look down their long noses at you when when something's going wrong are you hearing what i'm saying again let him who is without sin cast the first stone hey there we didn't bring any rocks in today because i already knew there's none of us that qualifies we would all be stoned to death to death we'd be dead but i am saying the bible very clearly teaches in, in dads pastor dads in the homes listen we gotta we gotta repent and get up and go we got to do the best we can in our homes, and then your local church comes alongside of you Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, and we, 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 we support the same truths together. We need that desperately. So God made a woman for Adam. That's significant. And then biblically, as you interpret the Scripture, Christian, marry a Christian, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, 1 Corinthians 7, 39, because you want a relationship that's going to build you up. Listen, if he can spell church, that doesn't count. If that's all he can do. If he doesn't know where Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, then you need to lose where he is. All right? Ladies, if you're having to buy his way to the movies or to the concert or to the D now, which we paid for, I think, this year completely. But, but I mean, if you're having to put gas in his truck, you, lady, are paying for his hunting club membership. Listen to me. You drop him like a hot rock. You, you, you delete his contact information in your phone. He, has, he, he needs some help. He needs discipleship. He might and probably needs conversion to Jesus. Listen to me, men. Hey, you are the initiator. You are the leader. You're going to be the prophet, the priest, the provider, and the protector in your home. You don't let the little ladies get pushed around, laughed at, mocked, and abused, and you certainly do not engage in that behavior with them. You're to be a man and, and, and learn what a godly man is and learn what a godly woman is, and they are beautiful things. Now, I know the world has, has tarnished that, and, and, and we are still sinners, and we still mess up, and again, no one was perfect but Jesus just a good little maxim to keep in mind but i'm going to tell you we've got to learn these basic truths to try to to help homes and families and and for the sake of the glory of god himself we need to do better in this area of biblical sexuality listen lady girls you look for a man who fears uh fears the lord loves jesus hates sin especially his own sin who respects authority so when your dad says hey i want you home at 9 30 he's not one trying to push it and say hey, well you know he doesn't really mean that we'll get home at 10 10 30 11 no you want a man who respects authority hey listen you cannot be over until you're first under now that works in the home too right Look at 1 Corinthians 11, 3. The, the, head, the head, right, of the wife is the husband, right? The head of Christ is God. So it's, it's, it's talking there about levels of authority. 
And so if you're going to be properly over anything, biblically speaking, you must be rightfully under the authority you're supposed to be under. So in homes, there may be wives who do not submit to the leadership of their own husbands in the biblical way. It's not slavery. We don't have time to get into all that today, but we can do it if we need to, but not today. But it's so important. Because, again, what they see you do, they're going to do. And so to be over, you have to be under. That's an important principle. We don't have time to develop further on that. So God gives and then governs our desire for marriage. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord on that. All right. Number three. And I got to move along with this one. God designed marriage to be the highest of all earthly relationships. God designed marriage marriage to be the highest of all earthly relationships. Verses 24 and 25, therefore, here what Jesus quoted in Matthew 19, or what Matthew recorded as Jesus said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So God designed marriage to be the highest of all earthly relationships. We see in verse 24, severance. The man should leave his father and his mother. That does not mean you get married and change your cell phone number and you never connect with your parents. Listen, commandment number five is a big one. Honor your father and your mother. And it will go well with you. You will have long life in the land when you honor your father and your mother. But here, so, it, so, but there is to be a breaking away. There's the creation of a new family uh, unit, if you will. There, there's the principle of severance. The man shall leave his father and his mother. Again, he needs to be mature, ladies. That's why I said if he, if he can't get a job and keep a job, if he's stressing out, you know, working part-time at uh, Lenny's sub shop, then, again, just from a biblical spiritual, economic, maturity level. He's not probably going to be able to make a house payment pretty good, right? I mean, so those are, you say, well, that's, that's practical. stuff. Well, hey, we, we live in a practical world, and God is practical. And we, so, man, you need to be mature enough to, to get out on your own, have a job, pay some bills. That's what I'm looking for, all right? We don't want our daughters to marry a slob, right? A future, you know, broke person. Right? So, and you say, well, you know, we don't know. And I, I understand that. I'm getting way off key here. I'm, come, I'm pulling myself back in because I get so passionate about these things because that's my daughter. And before I hand her, well, before I put your little hand around her arm and let you take her off with you, you're going to have to prove some stuff to me. That's right. You're going to have to prove. You, you just don't get to grab Mary Grace and just do what you want. Oh, no, 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 no. No, no. And every dad in this room ought to be feeling the same way and 10 times more maybe than me. Let's get ramped up over this stuff. man. That's our, that's our baby girl, whether she's 21 or 19 or, or 11 or whatever she might be, or you're still holding her in your arms right now and she's four or five months old. She's your baby girl. There are biblical things that we need to know and then apply and, and steal into them. But hey, man, be careful. You're the gatekeeper. You're the gatekeeper. But there's several. There's also permanence. That a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast. That speaks of, 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 of not breaking up. And that's something the church needs to work on for sure today. Unity. There's unity here. Those, and they shall become one flesh. End of verse 24. They become one. They become one physically in, in sexual intimacy. And they grow as one emotionally and spiritually. Then the fourth thing here is intimacy. The man and his wife are both naked and we're not ashamed. And so there's a physical dimension to nakedness. But there's also that spiritual and emotional nakedness where you, you share all things. Have no secrets with your husband and your wife. And you grow in that intimacy over the course of your marriage. Much more could be said on that. So let nothing interfere with your marriage. My marriage main point that I've got to stop with, God designed marriage between a biological man and a biological woman to be the highest of all earthly priorities. <laughs> that means men, we can't run with the boys like you did before you got married. It means girls, you, you can't just have a girl, girlfriend's, you know, weekend like every weekend. I mean, you have a new responsibility. Your highest earthly priority is your wife. Your highest earthly priority is your husband, not even your children. And they need to know that. Verse 
when there's a little dispute in your home, don't go call your mama and tell her. You should have heard what she said to me. Don't do that. Jerry Vine said about 30-some years ago, just stay home, work it out, fight through it, repent, make up, get over it, and move on. All right? Marriage is significant. And the ultimate reason is because in Ephesians 5, 31 and 32, God intends for our marriages to display the gospel of Christ. That does not mean that does not mean that we project perfection. Listen, one of the worst things you could try to do is to let everybody think, hey, I got it, I'm perfect, we good. I've had people tell me, how you doing, man? I'm living a dream. I'm living a dream. Well, from what I've heard from people close to you, it's more like a nightmare. <laughs> We're struggling. But there is good news for wherever you are today. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, talk about that good news. And I do want to flip to that for just a moment. And it might be worthy of you doing that. And I appreciate your patience with me this morning. First Corinthians chapter 6. This, this is hope for you, for your daughter, for your son, for your wife, for your husband, for your marriage, for your neighbors that are struggling with these issues. This is grace. And I love these verses. I know they're not unfamiliar to us here at Crawford. I know that. But I want us to let me read them as we close. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Those who are unrighteous will not go to heaven. That's the King James translation. Do not be deceived. Now, we can deceive one another. We can deceive our parents. We can deceive our siblings. We can deceive. But hey, God's never deceived. He's never in the dark. Notice what Paul says here. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. So those who continually, persistently live a lifestyle of any of those sins, and that covers a whole big swath, then it's saying that you're giving evidence that you're not truly born again. Now, if you say, I am a Christian and I am struggling with lust, or I am a Christian and I am struggling with, with uh, uh, rage and anger issues, or I am a Christian and I am struggling with lying, I am a Christian and I am, str that's different than saying I'm an anorexic Christian, or I am a belligerent Christian, or I am a, a whatever it may be. I'm a gay Christian is a popular thing today. I think that language is not helpful. I am a Christian, and I know that this is wrong. And by grace in the Holy Spirit, I am fighting against those desires within me. There's a big difference than just saying, I am this. And Paul gives us 2,000-year evidence in Scripture of people being converted by the Holy Spirit and the grace of God from lifestyles of idolatry and reviling and stealing and being just greedy, that attitude of, I always got to have what he got and got to have it better than he's got. Greedy. Wanting more for self, right? All these things listed in this list. People have been saved from those sins. He says, verse 11, such were some of you, amen. Such were some of you, such were us. We were these people. But if you're a Christian today, you're born again by the Spirit of God, so now you're made new by God. But you were washed. We sang about that this day. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. 1 John 1, 9. Oh, I love it. If we confess our sins, He, the Father, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so on this Sunday of 
Jesus on biblical sexuality. We stand in unity with our Canadian pastor brothers and Christians and parents in Canada where it is now illegal to say to even their own family and their own homes what I just told you. And there are are pastors across Canada today preaching a message on biblical sexuality. There are pastors in America that are preaching on biblical sexuality today. And I thank God we have the freedom in this land still to do that. But just as at the Young Lions Conference, we're going to have to be challenged. What if our government has passed the Equality Act? What if this is now considered hate speech, which I preach today? Do we shut up the book and go home? Do we start a knitting club? Have ice cream fellowships without Jesus? And what are we going to do? As the pastors Wednesday night in the, the video we watched, we're talking about, you know, Canada's kind of off the cliff right now. Hey, we're heading toward the same cliff. We're just a little bit back down the road from where they are. We need to stand strong for truth, but listen, always speak the truth in love. And again, hear me. I'm not identifying any one of those sins in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. They're all sinful. And that list puts me in that list. You've got to understand, we can't walk out the doors of this church building and say, okay, well, man, and people in that list, man, they in bad shape. Hey, we're in there somewhere. I want to be clear. You are in there somewhere. Apart from God's mercy and grace, we are lost, separated from God, condemned. We're without hope in this world. We need Jesus. And Jesus died for sinners, and that's a great thing because every human being qualifies. And the Bible says that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord, the biblical Jesus, will be saved. And so this morning, would you bow your head and close your eyes with me as we conclude?